And I've come here to talk to you about... Well, let me begin this way. I had this little incident recently, a close call. I was making my rounds of Army airfields, checking up on safety the way I do. I arrived at my destination and started my approach. It was a pleasant day, calm and pretty quiet. And then, all of a sudden... Ouch! I wasn't badly hurt, but... Where had that turbulence come from? Hardly any wind. And there weren't any aircraft or helicopters flying around or even turning up. The only activity anywhere around was way across the field. But how could that Chinook have caused the turbulence? I hadn't been anywhere near his downwash, and everybody knows helicopters don't kick up any wake turbulence. Or do they? <laughs> I was telling about what happened to me at the club that night, and it was clear that other pilots thought the same way I did. There's no wake turbulence from a helicopter. I asked his opinion, and I got answers like these. Wake turbulence? Not from a helicopter? Nah, it must have been a control system malfunction. Damn wash, yeah. Wake turbulence? No such thing. Of course not. No way. But then I was right back where I started. If it wasn't wake turbulence, what was it? Well, I figured I'd try a little experiment. I waited for a helicopter to take off. Avoiding the downwash area directly below, I cut across behind it and slightly below. Whew, I almost didn't recover. I was a fool for trying it so close to the ground. But I had to know. So I went out and tried again at altitude. I took up formation position on a Huey directly behind him. No problem. Then I tried holding the position, but dropping down a little, just a few feet. And wow, I got pushed down by turbulence that wasn't supposed to be there. I figured to give it one more try. This time, I took up formation position slightly below to see what would happen if I moved a little to the side. It had been a hard and tiring and scary experiment, and I decided it was snooze time. I started to doze off thinking about what it had all meant. And suddenly, I remembered something. A movie I had once seen. Before I knew it, I dropped off to sleep. The movie came back to me in my dreams. It showed a model of a light aircraft in a smoke tunnel. You could actually see how the wing vortex is formed. Then it showed the real thing, wing vortexes from a jet transport. The smoke shows, plain as day, how the vortexes roll up on the outside and down in the center. It was already night by the time I woke up, but that dream had given me an idea. Find a smoke tower, have a helicopter fly past it, and see what happens. Simple. Good idea. 
but we can't do it for you. I've got no budget for a project like that. I can't help, but let me know how it turns out, okay? Sounds great, but who's going to build the smoke towers? I did a lot of asking around and got a lot of turndowns. But if you stick with a good idea long enough, you almost always find a way. Take it from a wise old owl. Turned out the FAA had just what I needed at the research outfit in Atlantic City. I made all the arrangements and flew in for the test. The next day, everything was ready at last, and I thought, here it comes, the big moment when I'll get the proof. Nothing. It doesn't... Wait a minute. Look at that. Vortexes. Two of them plain as day. It does. It really does. A helicopter does generate vortex turbulence just like a fixed-wing aircraft. Now you know, Orville. There is vortex turbulence from a helicopter. Who said that? Who are you? Me? Why, I'm your friendly off-screen narrator. You know, the voice you always hear in training films. Where are you? I can't see you. Of course not. You never see me. I'm just a voice. But what are you doing in my movie? I've come to tell you some things about rotor vortexes. And I'll start with what you can see right here. Notice that there are two vortexes. One from each side of the rotor disc. They both roll inward and down in the center. So that's why I was pushed down once and up another time. Right. Now, when a helicopter is at a hover under no wind conditions, the turbulence, of course, goes straight down. At a slow forward speed, it begins trailing behind slightly. Faster, and it's going as much behind as down. Up around cruise speed, the turbulence wake is like a tail behind the aircraft, drifting down slowly to lower altitude. This tail can be quite long, as much as a couple of miles behind the helicopter. How large and severe the wake is depends uh, more or less on the size of the helicopter and how much load it's carrying. When a helicopter is flying near the ground, the vortexes descend as usual until ground effect takes over. Then they start traveling along the ground at about five knots. But consider how the wind can affect this. With a crosswind of five knots, one vortex travels away twice as fast. The other remains at the same spot and may linger for several minutes. But the most important point of all is this. The wake turbulence from a helicopter may be as intense as that from a heavy, high-performance fixed-wing aircraft. As bad as that? Who would have thought it? So then the question is, what are the safety guidelines a helicopter pilot should follow to avoid wake turbulence accidents? The most dangerous situation is close formation flying. You're okay so long as you stay at or above the level of the aircraft ahead of you. Do not let yourself descend below this altitude. That's where the turbulence is. Around an airport, you're operating near the ground and in proximity with other aircraft. You need to keep the turbulence hazard in mind all the time. If you're following another aircraft on approach, fixed wing or helicopter, remember that his turbulence is behind and below. Avoid it by following the same approach path or a steeper one. Be alert to how the winds can carry turbulence across the field to where you are, or hold it stationary at one spot on the field. From away across the field? So that Chinook really could have been the cause of my problem. Sure could have. It was generating a lot of wake turbulence. The wind could have carried it right across the field. I'm convinced there really is vortex turbulence from a helicopter. It's always there, and it can be violent. Tonight. I'm convinced. How about you?
That was just one of more than 300,000 practice power-off landings that will be executed by Army pilots this year. Well, that one pilot, it was another chance to rehearse under completely controlled conditions, emergency procedures that might save his life, his crew, and his aircraft, if he should ever lose his engine while in flight. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Bob Evans of USAVES, the United States Army Agency for Aviation Safety. Now, as pilots, we all know that uh, there is a certain amount of risk involved in any power-off landing. But we can reduce that risk if all of us, pilots, command and staff, know what we're doing. Department of Army policy says we'll conduct practice power-off landings and also lay out standard conditions and procedures that will be observed. So for the next few minutes, we're going to review not only what happens during auto rotation, but also the parameters of the training environment established by policy that must be satisfied before practice power-up landing can begin. The whole idea is to get us up to speed to handle an emergency that we hope will never happen. And do it safely. It's important to have a good understanding of what's happening physically during auto rotation because these factors underlie everything that's required for maximum safety procedurally. Let's look at the situation in normal straight and level flight. Rotor motion generates a downflow through the main rotor disc. Lift overcomes the force of gravity or weight. A forward component of rotor thrust provides a force to overcome helicopter drag. All forces are balanced, and the engine is producing the torque to maintain a constant rotor RPM. But what happens if now the engine fails? Engine power is no longer available to maintain rotor RPM. Downflow through the rotor decreases to the point it is replaced by an upflow due to the aircraft's descent. Looked at in another way, as a result of the engine failure, lift and thrust start to decrease. In addition to this, Another factor is aggravating the situation. The radical change in relative wind produces a high angle of attack, and the resulting high drag slows the rotor, threatening to stall the blades unless corrective action is taken. The danger is that without immediate positive pilot action to change the angle of attack, rotor RPM will decay rapidly due to profile and induced drag. And because rotor lift varies as the square of the RPM, lift capability will be lost at a substantially higher rate. If this continues too long, rate of descent may exceed auto rotation capabilities for recovery. For example, a 10% reduction in RPM leads to a 20% reduction in rotor lift, a one to two ratio. For this reason, it is crucial to take all necessary steps as quickly as possible upon engine loss to ensure that rotor RPM is maintained. The obvious pilot action is an immediate down collective that promptly reduces pitch and angle of attack, and then to establish the required velocity of flow through the rotor that will ensure maintenance of rotor RPM. This can be achieved by descending vertically, but the rate of descent must be very high in the several thousands of feet per minute, and obviously enough altitude must be available for this purpose. On the other hand, Forward motion can be made to contribute a substantial share of the flow at a much reduced rate of descent. At zero or low air speeds, you can expect high rates of descent. The rate declines to some minimum point with an increase in air speed, a flight condition you can choose by adjusting aircraft attitude in auto rotation. In many cases, minimum rate of descent is the preferred condition. By changing attitude to increase air speed, rate of descent again climbs until a maximum range condition is achieved. Increases in air speeds beyond this point are no longer optimal and may even be dangerous due to progressive loss of lift. The standard procedures governing practice power off landings in the Army are designed to produce a rate of descent that is a compromise between minimum descent and maximum range points. This also provides generous options for you to exercise in emergencies, 
allowing you to select any airspeed in the included spectrum for landing spot selection purposes without risking a hard landing. The allowable options translate into distance over the ground that, depending upon entry altitude, can be measured in the tens to hundreds of feet. If altitude remains the same, risk of hard landing, serious damage to the aircraft, personnel injury, or even death increases with either a decrease or increase in airspeed. Trying to stretch a glide by increasing airspeed beyond the maximum range rate of descent can lead to disaster, just as surely as decreasing airspeed below the minimum rate of descent. Looking at your options from overhead, range over the ground available to you from the initial entry point decreases if a turning maneuver is involved due to the higher rate of descent that results from increased aircraft G-loading, even while RPM is maintained. Again, some degree of choice between minimum rate of descent and maximum range is available. But attempting air speeds and rates of descent above and below the optimum band again can lead to serious consequences. All right, those are some of the concepts that apply to auto rotation. But in the execution of the power off landing, there are many additional factors involved, so let's consider it in more detail. The landing maneuver must be conducted in phases, each of which has a specific purpose related to controlling rate of descent or airspeed, or both. The line of flight from entry to touchdown is therefore rarely a straight line, except at descent angles close to vertical where forward ground speeds are low. Achieving proper flight conditions that will set up auto rotation is of critical importance at entry. The objective is not only to down collective to reduce drag on the rotor, but also to counter loss of engine torque by adding right pedal, and then to select an attitude that will produce the proper airspeed and thereby the proper rotor RPM. This will place RPM in mid green. You might call the initial part of power off landing the steady state phase. This serves two main purposes. You adjust the controls to maintain rotor RPM and consequently preserve a suitable degree of lift so that descent to a lower altitude can be achieved safely. And also to conserve the kinetic energy available in the rotating mass of the rotor for application during later phases of the maneuver. At about 100 feet above ground level, a new phase begins, deceleration. The objective here is to decelerate forward motion and increase rotor inertia and RPM. Deceleration involves a substantial change in attitude, placing the rotor nearly normal to the flow into the rotor. As it is exposed to the full flow of the airstream, the effect is to accelerate the rotor. But this increase in RPM is at the expense of airspeed, a deliberate trade-off for during deceleration, the rotor is also building up both lift and kinetic energy due to that increased RPM. And both of these must be present if the next phase, at about 10 to 15 feet, is to succeed. During the entire auto rotation to this point, collective has been pulled down. But now, an initial pitch pull puts a portion of that increased lift to work. During the initial pitch pull phase, that rotor energy that was built up is drawn on to sharply reduce rate of descent, and this affects both attitude and airspeed. By continuing to pull collective, you expend that high kinetic energy level built up in the rotor during deceleration, and which forces the rotor to continue its rotation during the landing phase, even though airspeed due to forward motion is lacking. The amount of kinetic energy stored in the rotor system is related to its mass and the effects of inertia. Low mass, low inertia rotors give up their energy quite rapidly. High mass, high inertia rotors persist in their rotation for longer periods of time. The effect is to cushion the landing, using the available lift to control descent, touchdown, and to hold the aircraft weight off of the landing gear during runout, if any. Only after aircraft motion is stopped do you down the collective fully to conclude the landing. That was a good standard practice auto rotation. Each phase was carried out just about right on the mark, 
and be advised that the penalty for failing to observe the successive requirements for each phase of a power-off landing can be pretty drastic. You can bend or ball up an aircraft without too much trouble. Test pilots have placed themselves at considerable risk in engineering test flights to locate the autorotative limits of each helicopter in the Army inventory. Sometimes the only way to find out where the limit is is to step over it, like this pilot did. Fortunately, this time he walked away from it. Operating in the caution or danger areas of the high velocity diagram, in this case, low airspeed and insufficient altitude for autorotative recovery can lead to hard landings. There's no denying the potential risks in power off landings. But aviation safety organizations such as USAVES, together with various aviation center departments, have helped to define the operational and procedural constraints that can lead to the execution of practice power off landings with reasonable safety. It's these constraints that underlie Department of the Army policy with respect to helicopter power-off landings. The controlling idea is that power-off landing is strictly an emergency procedure. It should never be indulged in just for kicks or casually in uncontrolled circumstances. Accordingly, Army policy requires us to conform to specified criteria before we enter flight training for power-off landings. And it also requires that this training be conducted according to standard procedures that have safeguards structured into them.